welcome each of you and thank each of you for coming out today. We are on our third installment of our study through Isaiah chapter 40, and we have three more to go after this. Although we don't like to admit it, you and I are people who desperately need help. Even some of the greatest and even some of the most popular people in our world need help. Back in the 60s, a group became extremely popular and feeling the pressure for becoming widely popular in the United States, one of the most famous bands of the last century published a song with just this title. They published a song and even an album called Help. And for those of you who are tracking with me, know that this popular group was the Beatles. The Beatles published a song in 1965 called Help. And here are some of the lyrics. When I was younger, so much younger than today, I never needed anybody's help in any way. But now those days are gone, I'm not so, so self-assured. But now I find I've changed my mind and opened up the doors. Help me if you can, I'm feeling down. And I do appreciate you being around. Help me get back on my feet, on the ground. Won't you please, please help me? And it really does sound like a desperate cry of help. According to one article that I read, John Lennon, who was one of the authors of this song, said that he felt depressed and, and really saddened and not really quite sure what to do in the midst of the Beatles' rise to fame in the 1960s. He needed help, and this song was one of the ways that he subtly asked the people for help. We all need help. And our problems don't necessarily come from a rise in fame. I don't know if I'm talking to many people who are popular or famous. Rather, we in our day face many distressing circumstances. You look at the news, the coronavirus is going on. You see the riots going on. And we look at our world and we see injustice, both on a government level and from a people-to-people -people level. We see racial injustice. We see injustice done in the government. We see riots and protests. And we also face the daily struggles of just living like a Christian. We need help navigating the Christian life, living in this world, and even fighting our own sin struggles. And we are a people who are constantly in need of aid. And we wonder, will anybody ever come and fix the circumstances which we've been placed in? Will anybody come and fix the sin that I fight inside of me? Will anyone come and fix the problems that we see in our society? Where is God and what is he doing? And as we approach Isaiah chapter 40, I want to review with you where we've been. We've seen that Israel was a people in desperate need of help. They were about to be taken captive to Babylon for their own sin, and they were discouraged and they were despairing. In the last two weeks, we said that we often, unfortunately, live only by what we can see. We live only by the reality that's set in four of us. Rather, though, I've said, we must live by waiting on our glorious God. And waiting doesn't look like sitting around doing nothing. It means expecting God to work in the future. It means trusting that God will work now. And it also means humbly living in obedience to God day by day. Then the next question we asked is, well, how do we wait? And these next series of studies that we did last week and are continuing to do are explaining that concept of how we wait on the Lord. Last week, we saw that we wait on the Lord by looking to his coming. And today what I want to do is turn your attention to one other aspect of God's character. One other aspect of God's character is his help. We must wait on God by looking to his help. And today we'll be in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 9 through 11. Read along as I read verse 9 of Isaiah chapter 40. It says, O Zion, that bringest good tidings, get thee up into a high mountain, O Jerusalem, that bringest good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up, be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Before we move any further, I do just want to say, the way that it, the text is worded here, and it's worded in almost every other translation, um, makes it sound like Zion, or Jerusalem, is the herald. I actually prefer the way the NIV reads it, where it says this, You who bring good news to Zion, go up on a high mountain. You who bring good news to Jerusalem, lift up your voice with a shout. And so I think really what the text of Isaiah is doing here is there is a messenger proclaiming good news to Zion. I think it best fits with the context and even the flow of scripture um, and even the Hebrew text. So I think what's happening here is there is a herald coming up to Zion 
And there is a herald coming up to Jerusalem and saying, there is good news coming. And what's the message? If you look back at the text, the message is this, behold your God. It says, look intently at your God. You know, often when we are in the midst of circumstances that we don't like, that we don't favor, that are tough, we often can be blinded by the circumstances that we place right before our very face. And what this messenger to Zion and what this messenger to Jerusalem does is he says, get your eyes off of your circumstances and look towards your God. And there's two things that we are going to look at today. God provides us help, and there are two aspects of the help that God provides that we are called to look at. First, we are called to look at the help he provides with his great might. He helps with his great might. And we find this in verse 10. Isaiah 49 verse 10 says this, Behold, the Lord God will come with strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. The phrase strong hand refers to his strength, refers to the strength and the might of God. And it means that God is mighty. Whatever God sets out to accomplish, he'll do. Now, I know some of you love to tinker around with different things and different materials. Maybe your yard or your garage looks like um, a dumpster with so many different things around it. And maybe you have a list of unfinished projects sitting around your house that you say, I'm going to get to eventually. Well, the point of this passage is that whatever God decides to do, he finishes and he does perfectly and he will accomplish his plans. There is never a moment that our God is not strong, that our God is not powerful, and that our God does not accomplish everything he sets out to do. Millard Erickson, one writer, says this about God's power. He says, God's will is never frustrated. What he chooses to do, he accomplishes, for he has the ability to do it. Psalm 115.3 says to the unbelievers, our God is in the heaven, and he does whatever he pleases. And God's strength is displayed all throughout the world. We see his strength in nature with the powerful storms we see, or with deadly viruses, or with um, all different things. We see the power of nature, which demonstrates God's power. Or we look at history and how we watch how God works through history. But God's power is very often associated Yes, with nature. Yes, with history. But with salvation. God's power is most on display in salvation. In Exodus 6, 1, God says that Pharaoh will lead the, will push the people out with a strong hand. And in Exodus 13, 9, it says, With a strong hand hath the Lord brought thee out of Egypt. The Israelites often associated God's salvation with his strength. Nehemiah 1.10 pictures God leading his people out of Persian captivity, and that's described as God's strength. Or Jeremiah 50.34 says, Their Redeemer is strong. One passage that I love, and love to go back to quite often, is Romans 1.16. And in it, Paul says this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation for everyone that believeth. So, God's power is on display in salvation. Yes, in nature. Yes, in history. But look around you. The most glorious display of all of God's power is in the gospel. You know, we often look around at powerful people around us and we think they're strong. We think they have influence. We look at the rulers in our day, our governors, our president, our leaders, and we think, man, I wish I could have the influence that they have. Or we look at some of these protesters or rioters are doing and you see the influence that they have and you say, wow, I wish I could make a difference like them. And God says, look around. Look around at all the power in the world. None of that compares to the power of God. God says, look at the mountains. That's not the best display of his power. He says, look at the sky or the sea. He says, that's not the best display of my power. He says, do you want to know the best display of my power? Look to Christ hanging on the cross and rising from the dead because there the power of God is found. The greatest display of God's power is his sovereign moving through history 
to accomplish his plan of redemption, to bring the gospel. So, what is God doing right now? What is God doing during this time? He is using his power to draw people to himself, to save them, and to redeem them. And so we can rest because our God comes in might. We can rest because he controls everything. Nothing happens outside of his control. He is strong to save, and he is working to save souls today. But we can also share the gospel in the midst of this dark time. So we are to look to his help. And one way that he helps us is his great might. He comes in might, but he also rules in might. Look again at verse 10. It says, His arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. The coming of the Lord will demonstrate his rule over everything. And the book of Isaiah shows that he is the Lord over all things right now. Isaiah 41, uh, 2 and 4 says he gives up nations before him so that he tramples kings underfoot. He makes them like dust with his sword. Or Isaiah 42, verse 1. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit on him, and he will bring forth justice to the nations. In Isaiah 45, he says that he will use uh, Cyrus to accomplish his plans. And to God, all the nations are like a drop in the bucket. He sets up kings, he tears down kings. Jesus rules right now over everything. He rules, and he reigns. And although he will come in the future, he is also sovereign over today. Earlier in the book of Isaiah, in Isaiah 6, 1, the prophet Isaiah sees a vision of God. Isaiah 6, 1 says that in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And in fact, John the Apostle quotes this in John 21, or John 12, 41, John 12, 41, and makes this refer to Christ. Isaiah sees Christ seated high and lifted up, and he sees that he is completely in control of all things. And this throne is the throne from which he rules everything. Even in the book of Revelation, chapter 4, we see Jesus reigning on a throne. Revelation 4, verses 2 and 3 says this, At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. And the whole point of the book of Revelation, and I think what Revelation is telling us, the whole point of history, is that God is seated on a throne, and everything that happens comes from his throne room, and nothing happens that does not come from him. He reigns now, but he will also reign in the future. And going back to Isaiah chapter 40, it says his reward is with him, and his work, or his recompense, is before him. He will come one day to bring both judgment and a reward. In Isaiah 62, 11, it talks about the rewarding of Israel. But in Revelation 22, 12 to 13, which this passage is also quoted, it talks about the punishment of sinners. Revelation 22, 12 to 13 says, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according to his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. His coming will bring ultimate justice, and his judgment will be perfect. Now, this doesn't mean that we neglect to do justice today, and doesn't mean that we neglect to do good today, but it does mean that we can rest in the fact that one day Christ will bring justice. Now, this judgment will be according to works, as Revelation said, and one group of people who continually commit sin and are living in sin will be punished and sentenced to the lake of fire. But those of us who are believers, we will not be judged by our works, but we will be clothed in the righteous works of Christ. His imputed righteousness will be given to us, and he'll look at us and accept us, based on not our own works, but on the works of Jesus. So we are to take comfort, because he will make all things right, and he will enact perfect justice. The first attribute of help that we see is Christ's strength. 
He comes in strength and brings salvation to all people. He works all things according to the counsel of will, and he rules in strength right now, and he will come in judgment in the future. Those on the last day will either be justified based on the work of Christ or condemned based on their own sinful works. And so how does he help us? He provides us his strength, his strength in salvation and also his strength in justice. And we are people who need to look to that help. We are to look to his strength. But second, there's another way in which he helps us. He helps us not only with his strength, but he also helps us with his great care. Look at Isaiah 40, verse 11. Isaiah says, He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm, and carry them in his bosom, and shall gently lead those that are with young. This passage describes Christ not only as a coming ruler in strength, but also as a shepherd who gently cares for his people. It says that he shall feed and tend his flock, and the idea there is of care, of a compassion, of a nourishment, of a protection, that his people are safe. And how does he do this? It says that he gathers them in his arms and he carries them in his bosom. And we're safe. We're secure. This, of course, applies to Israel, but Jesus comes along and says that he's the good shepherd and he does this for all of his people. He also says that he will gently lead those that are young. The young refer to the ones who are the weakest in the community. They have no strength to help themselves and they are unable to really care for themselves. And Jesus comes up and he cares for us. As you know, Jesus describes himself as the good shepherd. In John 10, he, in John 10 verse 11, he says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. And there's a few aspects of Christ being the good shepherd that we have to understand. In John 10 verse 14, it says that he knows us intimately. He says, I'm the good shepherd and I know my sheep and I am known by them. He knows your needs far better than you do. Also, he pursues us passionately. In John 10, 16, he says, Other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice. What's the point? He wants us. Jesus wants us. Then also, he gives for us sacrificially. John 10 says that he lays down his life for his sheep. And he gave his life to give us salvation. God cares for you. He is our shepherd right now. And he demonstrated that by providing for us, by bringing salvation to us. He knows your needs intimately and pursues you and wants you. You really couldn't have asked for somebody better to take care of your life. He cares for you perfectly. He couldn't care for you any better. He will be your shepherd in the future. When he comes and when we live on the new heaven and the new earth, he will bring in peace and he will take care of us like a shepherd and he will govern us in peace and justice. Your God provides help through his mighty strength and also his loving care. You must look to both his attributes of help, his strength and his care. So next time you're struggling with all that's going on in the world, you know, when you see riots, when you see abuse, when you see racism, know that your God provides help both now and the future. When you hear of ill news, rest because he is on his throne. Share the gospel with others because that's where the power of God is displayed. Seek for justice to reflect Christ's coming justice. And also depend on your shepherd to meet your needs because he cares for you like nobody else. Our God provides us abundant help, and he is the king seated on his throne, but he is also our shepherd. Wait on God by looking to his help. As I've done the last few times, I want to provide two passages for further study. The first one is John 10, and the second one is Revelation 4. John 10 describes Jesus as a shepherd, whereas Revelation 4 so shows Jesus sitting up on his throne. And these passages parallel what we've seen in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 9 to 11. Also, here's some various questions for reflection, and I hope they've been helpful. First question, in what areas of your life do you most need help at the moment? We say that we are needy people. What areas are you struggling in? Where do you need help? Question number two, 
How does God's attribute of strength provide help to your circumstances? In other words, we know that God is strong. How does his strength help us today? And then finally, how does God's attribute of care provide help to our circumstances? How does knowing the fact that God cares for us help us today? I want to thank you for joining me this week as we looked at the help our God provides. I'm praying that our Lord uses this study to minister to each of you, and I look forward to joining you again next Tuesday.